This is CS50. This is the start of week eight, and oh my god, have we got a lot of fun in store for the next few weeks. So by the end of today, you will be able to make this ridiculously annoying internet meme called Hamster Dance, uh, that has, uh, uh, whose uh, soundtrack is available on the course's website under lectures. But first, a few announcements today before we get there. So uh, one of your classmates is in the process of Recruiting folks for the Harvard Digital Media Group. This is a group of students who get together, eat pizza, talk with themselves and with professionals in the industry about social, about digital media. If you would like to partake, uh, go to cs50.net and there's a sign up link on the course's homepage at the moment. Also coming up is Hack Harvard, sponsored by uh, the I3 competition and the Undergraduate Council. Um, the UC has put this together toward an end of giving you guys an off-ramp from a course like CS50 so that if you tackle your final project over the next couple of months and you feel like, wow, I'd really like to take this to the next level, I'd really like this to be the next Harvard FML or I saw you Harvard or Facebook beyond Harvard's campus, um, this is an opportunity to work during J term with some of your friends or on your own, perhaps with some support from the Undergraduate Council and the I3 competition so that if you need a bit of cash, if you need a bit of space, if you need a bit of advice, you have resources available to you well beyond the end of the semester. This is distinct from the CS50 Hackathon, to be clear, which is coming up in December and really is just going to be an opportunity for us as a course to get together from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. and work on final projects if you so choose to partake. So that's what's on the horizon there. Um, the final project then. So this is the specification. There really should be no surprises since we talked about this in the first week and all the same information is in the syllabus. But do use this as your authoritative resource over the next couple of months as we plan for the final project and in turn the hackathon and the CS50 fair. Um, you might be wondering, well, we haven't even done web programming, we haven't even finished the course, how am I supposed to figure out a project to work on? Well, again, the goal of having this in your hands today is just to get you thinking about it, gets you to start looking around campus, looking around you in life um, for possible ideas. And it's also a chance to strike up a partnership with one or two friends, um, since the spec does allow you to work in a small team if you would like. So do read that over the course of this week and take note of the milestones, including a pre-proposal, which is simply an email to your teaching fellow in a couple of weeks that's just meant to get the juices flowing, give you an opportunity for a bit of preliminary feedback on the ideas you might be thinking about. Also, as we enter these last several weeks of the course, the goal is to make sure that you guys have um, some real world skills so that you don't exit the course and then wonder how in the world am I ever going to write another computer program if I don't have a cloud.cs50.net account. Well, rest assured that most everything we've been using in the course is very much industry standard. You can download most of the software we've been using onto your own laptops even, and as a step toward that you'll see that problem set uh, six, the spell checker tries to give you uh, some exposure to just using perhaps a more user friendly tool. Some of you might be familiar with Text Wrangler. It's a free text program for the Mac. Uh, it's similar in spirit to Notepad and those uh, sorts of things. Um, you can download it per problem set six's directions. But what's really nice, if you never noticed, is that under its file menu, it actually supports opening files from an SFTP server. And recall that's a protocol you used for problem set five to move bitmap and JPEG files back and forth. So if I want to, for instance, start working on problem set six in my account, rather than have the file on my own laptop, I can go to open from F SFTP server. I can type in cloud.cs50.net. I have to check the box for SFTP, lest it be insecure, which won't work. My username and password. I then go ahead and click connect. And what you see is a little graphical rendition of your home directory. And I've got a bunch of junk in there. But right now, I want pset6 maybe dictionary.c. And now, finally, all these weeks later, I have something that's a little more familiar, a little more versatile than something like Nano, so that you can now start to work client side, but still in a separate window by SSHing, can you then run the familiar commands like GDB and GCC, and you can continue compiling your code in that familiar environment. But now, can you do things like see syntax highlighted code client side? You can drag and cut and paste as usual, and realize that though I'm using a Mac, there is a free program called Notepad++, um, which allows you to do something very similar in the PC world. So you don't have to do that, but do try, to, uh, do try your hand at that. So one comment then about this. So um, this isn't where I hang out, at least. But we did, this did come to our attention, an excerpt from Harvard FML. So I was in CS50 office hours for three hours last night and never got helped once FML. Um, 
So, I mean, frankly, this is discouraging to see because this is certainly not the goal of having a team of 80 some odd teaching fellows and course assistants to actually have you guys going unhelped in office hours. So, realize this is a function of a couple of things. One,、um, as many people as we are, we certainly have our own scheduling constraints that we do strive to spread out over the course of the week.、Um, but realize, too, that if you are getting to office hours on Wednesdays and Thursdays in particular, and you're finding that it's this crazy assembly line、uh, environment,、um, realize that's kind of the nature of the beast. And we do take care to have office hours earlier in the week, fewer of them on Mondays and Tuesdays and even Sundays. And do realize if you're finding that you really need a more nurturing environment, frankly, than this、um, crazy Wednesday and Thursday nights environment allows for, do figure out a way to start the PSE on, on Friday or on Sunday so that you can take advantage of some greater attention that just by nature of the、uh, number of students in the class we can offer. Earlier in the week. But with that said, we recognize that it's one thing to say, please start earlier, and it、uh, doesn't actually happen often. So we will also simultaneously adjust our hours to try to、uh, tail load things on Wednesdays and Thursdays to better, han better handle the load. But do try to meet us halfway since we are happy to work with you so individually. So, how do we get、um, from nothing, an empty text file, to something like this? Or hopefully, frankly, something a little more compelling. So, there's this thing called the Internet. And today we start talking about it,、uh, the web, but also other tools and languages. So, we've spent much of the semester focused on C, not because knowing C specifically is a lifelong skill, but rather that particular language we actually think does provide a very solid foundation for a lot of more、uh, commonplace languages these days. I feel like I should. Probably move this off the screen lest it become too mesmerizing. So we'll go back to this, which is very stimulating.、Um, so The goal really of the next couple of weeks is to help you realize that once you know one language, like C, you can really bootstrap yourself into other languages, other technologies. Again, as I said last week, I learned formally C and C in a language called Lisp in CS50 and 51. And then that was it. Ever since then, I've picked up things as I go. I ask friends lots of questions. You Google around, you read a book. There's so many ways to learn this stuff. So one of the takeaways for this week and next is going to be、um, that you can absolutely pick up new languages quickly. Once you understand the underlying fundamentals. And so, even though this week for the P set you're implementing this thing called a hash table, next week you're going to just get to use a hash table with one line of code and this language called PHP and another called JavaScript will just give you a hash table whenever you want it. You won't need to implement that yourself、um, from scratch. You can build on the shoulders of others and on years' worth of other technologies. So, How do we get there? Well, we need the right tool for the task. So, today we introduce web programming, and for that we have this language, PHP,、um, this other language called HTML, the latter of which is not a programming language because it can't tell the computer to do something, but it's a markup language in that it can tell the computer how to display something. It's an aesthetic language of sorts, but we need some place to put the code we're going to start writing. And up until now, you've been using cloud.cs50.net. Even though you've been SSHing to that server, it turns out that it's available via a Another protocol called HTTP. And this is something you've been probably desensitized to over the years. But in the URL, in almost every URL that you visit in a browser, is, even if you didn't type it, HTTP colon slash slash or HTTPS colon slash slash. And that's hypertext. Transfer protocol. And this is just a language. It's a, set of, it's a protocol, a set of conventions that web browsers and web servers use to speak to one another in order to let you request a web page and let you get back that web page. And even though we'll focus today and on Wednesday on the languages involved in this process, realize that there's some really juicy material in there. And if you're liking computer science, realize you can go off in really neat directions in hardware and networking. And we'll really just scratch the surface of some of that this week. But we need an internet. We need a bunch of computers. Some Somehow connected together that will get data from point A to point B. And though this, this video you're about to see takes a few liberties with, let's say, accuracy, it does nonetheless paint a reasonable picture of what's actually going on on the internet when data travels from point A to point B. So I give you warriors of the net. <laughs> With a message, with a protocol, all his own. He came to a world of. 
cruel firewalls, uncaring routers, and dangers far worse than death. He's fast, he's strong, he's TCP IP, and he's got your address. Warriors of the Net. So that's just the teaser trailer for what's actually a longer video that discusses how the internet works. But for today, we're just going to take at face value that that is how the internet works. All right. So <laughs> there is this, this protocol, this language called TCP IP. And this is, again, just a set of standards that computers speak. Client computers like your laptops, the server computers like the cloud speak in order to move data from point A to point B. And what's neat about the internet and networks in general is that there's years worth of interesting layering going on. We won't spend time on this in this class, but in CS 143 networks, would you spend more time on this? There's this layer called Ethernet. You're all probably familiar with the idea of an Ethernet cable, even if you don't use them anymore. And that's pretty low level technology because it pretty much boils down to electricity flowing through a wire, actually transmitting what represent zeros and ones. And just to flash back to week zero and one, well, how do you actually send bits on a wire, bits on a network? You know, in simple form, you can imagine turning electricity on so electrons are flowing to represent a one, then turn it off. Now you've got a zero. It's more sophisticated than that, but at least you can code zeros and ones using electrical signals. So we'll take that for granted. Then on top of Ethernet, you have something called IP, Internet Protocol. And this is a protocol, a set of standards, that says every machine on the internet needs a unique address, an IP,、uh, a numeric address, generally known as a IP address. And this is just a number that's something of the form number, dot number, dot number, dot number. If you maintained your home router at home, it probably looked a little something like this, because there are constraints on what numbers can be there. As an aside, each of those hash symbols represents an 8 bit value. So that means each hash Symbol is 0 through 255 with a few more constraints. The implication is that if you have 8 bits plus 8 bits plus 8 bits plus 8 bits, that's 32, which gives us how many possible IP addresses? <laughs> 30, uh, it gives us 32 bits worth of address space. That gives us 4 billion, right? 2 to the 32 is 4 billion possible IP addresses. And scary thought, the world is running out. So there's a lot of doomsday sayers saying how things will start breaking down before long because we are running out of IP addresses. But thankfully, there's a version 6 of IP which uses 128 bit addresses, which will hopefully save the day if people start using it. But for now, all we care about is that there's Ethernet, which gets data physically from A to B. There's IP, which kind of assigns, an, which does assign an address to every computer. Computer on the internet, much like the US Postal Service puts a unique address on your mailbox so mail can get from point A to point B. And then there's other mechanisms on top. One of them is called TCP, the、uh, hence the TCP IP、uh, protocol. TCP is just a protocol, a set of conventions that says not only do I want data to flow from point A to point B, I want to make sure that data gets from point A to point B. So TCP's purpose in life is to keep track of all the data that flows across the internet. Between points A and B. And if any packets get lost or corrupted or dropped by a firewall, if they just disappear somewhere into the, the ether, so to speak, TCP's purpose in life is to tell my computer A, resend that same data to、uh, point B. And so this is why you either get an email or you don't. You either download a file or you don't. Um, or at least part of a file, you don't necessarily get、uh, bits and pieces of an email. It's mostly an all or nothing thing, and that's largely the result of TCP. But there are other protocols that you can actually use. So we have Ethernet, we have IP, we have TCP, and then finally we have HTTP. And so this layering is deliberate. The people who invented HTTP just wanted to assume that all this stuff on the bottom actually worked and got data from point A to point B. So we'll be focusing this week and next on using this highest level、uh, HTTP and in turn this language called. HTML. But just so that you have a sense of what's really going on underneath the hood, I've gone ahead here and I've SSH to a server.、Uh, let me go ahead and log back in. And it turns out on a lot of Linux and Unix systems, there's a command called traceroute, which will trace the route between points A and B. And what's actually pretty neat about this is that it helps us see if, for diagnostic or pedagogical purposes, exactly what's going on. Between points A and B. So I do not obviously have a connection physically to, say, Stanford University. It's all the way over on the West Coast. But there is this internet, and the internet is composed of all of these things called routers, which are fancy computers that sit in data centers whose purpose in life is to take data in here, look at that data, look specifically at the IP address, and realize, oh, this IP address lives on the West Coast. So a router then routes that packet that way to the West Coast. And it might then reach another router who makes the same decision. So router is as kind 
kind of depicted by that、uh, little video there, move data in different directions, left, right, top, down, depending on where they're destined geographically. So you can actually see these things called routers, not when you send an email or pull up a web page, but if you do a bit of poking around. So I'm just at a command prompt here on a Linux system、um, that's owned by the Harvard Computer Society, one of the student groups on campus. I'm using them because most of FAS's systems don't let you do this, but theirs do, which is a useful trick, first class. So I'm going to go ahead and run trace route. Uh, www.stanford.edu and enter. And I see a whole bunch of output. Let me actually shrink this and rerun it. A whole bunch of output whereby every row in this output is numbered. And this first row, one, represents the first router on the internet that my data, point A, reaches on its way to point B, which is Stanford. So it looks like this first router doesn't have a name, because all I see are numbers in row one here, but it has an IP address, 140247. Dot 140247.89.130. Dot dot that belongs presumably to Harvard because Harvard owns、uh, whole, thousands of IP addresses, all of which start with 140.247. Now, how long did it take to get to that router, which is probably in the Science Center or somewhere proximal? Looks like it took about two, three milliseconds. And the fact that you see three numbers there just means this program tried three times just to give me a sense of、um, an average in case there's an anomaly. Where does it go next? Well, apparently, this router, wherever it is, is connected to core SC1GWVL412, whatever that is. Well, GW is、uh, shorthand notation for gateway, which is synonymous with router. So it looks like Harvard has a second router somewhere in the SC Science Center to which that router has some kind of connection. The next router is 128.103. something. That's also a prefix that Harvard owns.、Uh, any IPs in that range belong to Harvard. It doesn't have a name because the humans decide. Decided not to name it, but that's fine. But then we get to row four, BDRGW. Feels like Border Gateway. They're just being a little succinct with the names here. Gateway again is a router. Border means it's on the periphery of Harvard's campus. And sure enough, it's still in harvard.edu. But then it goes to row five, NOX300GW. And this is actually something called Northern Crossroads, which is a super big data center in the Northeast where lots of internet traffic comes into and then goes out of. So Harvard has a A physical connection to this northern crossroads setup. Those guys, in turn, have a whole bunch of routers inside their network. But this is kind of interesting. Once we get from row seven to row eight, where do we seem to be ending up? It looks like Kansas. So, humans who run servers tend to name routers based on the geography or the nearest airport code. So, K A N S, I'm going to suppose, is like you, Kansas. The next one's probably Houston. The other one, L O S. Los Angeles, probably. And then after that, yep, LAX denotes Los Angeles. So, what's happened, which is really neat here, between rows, let's say, seven, which we know to be in the Northeast, and definitely row 10 or 11, where we are in LA, there is some kind of connection, some really long wire between those two routers, because notice how long it takes to get to row 11 here. 80 milliseconds, which is up from 2 milliseconds when I was actually on Harvard's campus. So you can infer from the amount of time it's taking for the data to go from A to B roughly how far these geographies are apart, assuming you're on super fast connections. These asterisks here just mean、uh, the routers in between point A and B stopped、uh, paying attention to us. They started ignoring us at one point, and that's generally for privacy or security reasons. But let's try another one. Let's go ahead and do. Uh, trace route gmail.com. When you send an email to someone at Gmail, looks like it's pretty close, only 10 hops away, 10 routers, and it's a little harder to infer where this is. Oh, LGA. Looks like Gmail has one or more router, or Google has one or more routers in New York. So it looks like Google has a data center somewhere on the East Coast in New York, which makes intuitive sense. And we get there in only seven milliseconds. So that's pretty fast. What about CNN? Trace route cnn.com. All、right, here too, we seem to be jumping around states. We're going from Harvard to Boston to New York to DC to Atlanta to who knows where, but somewhere in there,、uh, there is CNN's actual servers. But let's do one other trick CNN.co.jp, which is the domain name for the Japanese version of CNN's website. And what's kind of neat here, if it cooperates, is we again go from Harvard to Boston to New York, New York, and then wow, notice what's between rows 10 and 14. An ocean, frankly, right? So, <laughs> right, we go from 7 milliseconds to 226 milliseconds. And in fact, there is, in fact, Tokyo is embedded here in the domain name. So it looks like we're probably going. 
、um, over the、uh, Pacific Ocean, assuming that's what these stars are kind of hiding from us,、um, because I see no mention of Europe.、So、maybe it did go the long way, but in fact, it might have hopped off the West Coast. And you can play with this all day long. The, the routes can certainly change. This is what's nice about the internet. It was originally designed with militaristic goals in mind so that it's supposed to be resilient against failures. If you take out one or more of these routers, hopefully it's a nice mesh, as that video briefly showed, so that data can go off in different directions. And this name, the World Wide Web, derives from this idea that there isn't just one connection between A and B, there is this web of connections that's fairly resilient these days, even when servers go down. So that's as much time as we'll spend on the underlying. Uh, implementation of the internet. Henceforth, we will now take for granted that there is this thing called an internet. So, how do we actually go about using it? Well, when you pull up a web browser, you are using a client. So, this thing on the left, and a client is just the name given to any machine that's frankly not a server. The client, much like in a restaurant, requests information of the server, and the server, the waiter or waitress, responds with that information or with that, that food. So, it's the same kind of relationship. So, here we just have a quick summary of what's going on when a web browser connects to a web server. And you can talk about machines being clients. My laptop is a client. We can also talk about software on a machine being a client. So, a web browser is a client. It really reduces not to the physical thing, but to what role they play in some、uh, two way relationship. So, a client requests data of a server. What does it mean to request data? Well, even though a normal person like us just goes to like CNN.com and then hits enter, well, there's a little more technicality going on underneath the hood. What's really going on is that your browser is sending a message to CNN.com, or rather to CNN.com's IP address, which it can figure out by asking something called a DNS server. So, quick aside, there's these things called DNS, domain name system servers, whose purpose in life is just to answer queries of the form, what is the IP address for CNN.com? Or here's an IP address, what is its domain name? So it remaps those two things to one another. So once my browser knows the IP address, it sends a message, frankly, as simple as this get slash, and then the language with which it wants to get it. So, generally, HTTP 1.1. What does slash denote? Well, as you probably noticed in a URL, CNN.com almost always gets changed by your browser to CNN.com slash. And if you go to CS50.net, it changes to CS50.net slash because slash, like on a local hard drive, generally denotes the root of the file system. Much like on a Linux system, it's similar in spirit to C colon backslash on a Windows PC. So, that's the message that this client here on the left hand side sends to the server. The server then Responds with a whole bunch of text with a text file containing a language called HTML. So, HTTP is the protocol, the set of standards that says when you want to request a web page, send a message like this from client to server. HTML is the language that just so happens to be embedded. In the response. But as you know from using the web, embedded in a response can be a graphic, a sound, a video. So HTTP doesn't care about what content's coming back,、um, just how to request it and how to hand it back. And we'll see that in more detail in just a moment. But let's see what kind of stuff is coming back. Well, let's go to the crimson.com and not focus so much on the content on the page, but the content underneath the hood. So I just went to Safari's view menu. You can do this with any browser. And I'm going to scroll past this fast because the Specifics aren't that interesting, but this gibberish or this Greek or however you want to view it is something called HTML. And in fact, it looks like there's some links on the Crimson's website to categories like food and drink, football, for the moment, game recaps, and they're all embedded in what looks like a fairly Uh, consistent structure. You've got an angled bracket, like a sideways triangle, the letter A, then the word class equals something, then href. Turns out href is going to mean hyper reference, and then a sh short URL. It's not a full URL because there's no mention of HTTP, but the fact that these hrefs start with a slash here just means that these URLs are relative to wherever the user currently is on the current server. It doesn't have to bounce the user to another server. We can do this for any website. If you go to cs50.net, Oops. And view source, you'll see that too, our page is composed with the same kind of text. And this is the neat thing. It's a little scary at first, perhaps, but the neat thing about the web is that it's so easy to learn new tricks, learn how other sites are implemented, because you can just look at their source code. And generally speaking, people don't consider HTML as intellectual content, right? There's really not much、uh, intellectual ownership in the HTML you're marking up. There might be copyright of the data, but it's very much an environment where you can learn from the work of others. And frankly, this is sort of 
sort of a nature of the technology. If you are requesting data as a web browser for information from a server, the server obviously has to hand it to you so that you know actually what to show the user on the screen. Unlike programs written in C, where you have this opportunity to compile them into zeros and ones, HTML is what we'll call an interpreted language, where it does not get turned into zeros and ones from the server, rather, it just gets sent raw. So when you write HTML source code and then request your web page from a browser to a server, what you get back is your HTML source code. And that's going to be true for JavaScript. And it's kind of going to be true for PHP, although, thankfully, with PHP, that language we'll see is executed on the server. It's not converted into zeros and ones per se, but it is analyzed and executed on the server so that what the user sees is just some boring HTML output, not the intellectual property that is my. PHP code. So, in short, for now, HTML is a markup language. It's an aesthetic language that says how to display things on the screen, and we'll start doing this ourselves in a moment. PHP is a true programming language with for loops and while loops and functions and variables and all of that with which you can implement logic and actually take input and produce output from a user. So, let's actually see what's going on when I visit a site like, well, we can do the、uh, Hamster dance. Let's go to,、uh, let me go ahead and open up Firefox. So, even though the course doesn't really care what browser you like to use, you can use any one you want.、Um, Firefox, frankly, has a really nice set of development tools. So, what you'll see in problem set seven later this week is that we recommend that you use some freely available tools because it really makes it easier, if not a little more fun, to develop websites because you can see a lot more what's going underneath the hood. Specifically, I've installed something called Firebug, which literally puts a bug in the bottom right hand corner of my screen. And then if I click it, I get this menu that actually allows me to look at what's going on underneath the hood with various websites without having to look at The mess that I just showed you, the raw source code. So let's go ahead to,、uh, I think it was called webhamster.com. Yep, that's it. Let me pull up Firebug. And it turns out this web page is actually pretty simple. I'll show you the raw source code. This is sort of like websites 1990 style. It's pretty darn simple, even though you might not understand all the syntax yet. But if I go over to this tab here, the net tab, notice what's about to happen. Right now it's blank. I'm going to reload the page. And in a moment, I'm going to see line by line a reference,、uh, a, a record of every file that's requested via HTTP. So, in other words, I can see what I predicted verbally goes on anytime you visit a web page. So, here we go. Reload. And it looks like, sure enough, to download this web page, it was necessary to make six HTTP requests. Each of those requests is from browser to server, asking the server for a different file. Let's look at the very first one. It looks like the very first one is the original one that I typed. Get the whole URL, webhamster.com. And now notice what comes back is this. Let me actually zoom out a little bit. Let me go ahead and show you this、uh, view. Got to click a little tiny link here. View source. So it's a little small, so I'm going to zoom in. I kind of lied a moment ago when I said all the browser sends is get slash HTTP slash version number. There's a few more details, but most of them are uninteresting in my defense. And so this first line is literally what my browser sent to the server, webhamster.com, after figuring out its IP address. And that is just shorthand notation for give me the default web page, give me the so called home page, which lives by convention at just slash. But the browser did send some additional information that I, the human, did not provide. This information is sent anytime you visit a web page. Specifically, the web browser reminds the server what host name or what domain name the user actually typed into the browser. This is useful as an aside because in the world, In the real world, you can buy or you can pay, you can rent web hosting space, storage space, like a cloud account for websites, but they're on shared servers where a company might have 10 or 100 other customers, all with their own domain names. Thankfully, anytime a browser requests a web page, it's supposed to tell the server, I want slash, but specifically for this website, webhamster.com. And this way, the, 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 the server can distinguish my requests from another customer's request from another customer's request. That's called shared web hosting. Which might pertain to some of your final projects if you guys decide to try to commercialize thereafter or just make them live on past the course. Then there's this stuff user agent. You might have heard that most websites know what browser you're using, what,、uh, what um, operating system you're using, what plugins you have installed. That's because your browser is very willingly giving up that information every time you request a web page. Most any website can tell you what version of Mac OS or Windows you're running, what browser you're running, as well as your IP address, obviously. Otherwise, the data couldn't get back to you. So there's a 
lot of juicy information websites know about you. Some of this stuff is technical and not all that interesting, but it relates to、um, how the page is encoded, whether or not it's compressed, and a few other details. But what comes back ultimately is the response. So if I actually scroll back up here and look at this response tab, you see exactly the source code. That came back. So when you request a URL, what you're really getting back is a file that might be a GIF, it might be a JPEG, or it might be a text file whose file extension is usually by convention .html. And inside that text file is just a bunch of stuff like this. But it follows a common structure. Let me look at the very top of the server's response, and we'll see that almost every website out there does, in fact, start with an open bracket. HTML close bracket, then inside of that or next to that is open bracket head for the head of the web page, followed by open bracket title, and then the actual title. And then this curiosity it turns out that HTML is very pedantic. When you tell the browser, start doing something, You almost always have to tell the browser later, stop doing something. So if I reinterpret what I'm seeing here, this open bracket HTML, this pretty much is, my,、uh, is the HTML telling the browser, here comes some HTML. Get ready to display it in the familiar way. Open bracket head, close bracket, says to the browser, here comes the head of the web page. Get ready to display the title and some other stuff.、Uh, here comes the title with open bracket title, close bracket. The title is to be hamster nance. And that's the word, those are the words you see at the very top of the window. But then when you have a tag, as these things are called, anything between brackets, angled brackets, is called a tag. Anytime that tag starts with a forward slash and then ends with the same word that the previous tag started with, that's kind of like the Opposite. It says stop displaying the title. So this is start the title, stop the title. And so accordingly, this is generally called a start tag, the title tag. This is called an end tag, or an open tag and a close tag. So long as you have some notion of symmetry, it doesn't really matter what you call them. Then we have this thing, the body tag. So there's mainly two big parts to a web page there's the head, in which very little tends to go, like the title, and then we'll see some stuff called cascading style sheets and some other stuff called JavaScript. But for the most part, the head is very small in a web page. It's the body where it's really 99% of the content usually. So the body tag says, here comes the body of the web page. But notice this interesting thing it turns out that tags. Kind of like functions in C can be parameterized. You can modify the default behavior of their,、uh, you can modify their default behavior by passing in something similar in spirit to arguments or parameters, but in this world they're called attributes. And any attribute is a keyword, like BG color, equals quote unquote, and then some value. So now you can probably guess BG color is. You know, background color. Why? Just some people 10, 15 years ago decided this is what will denote the background color of a page, BG color for short. And then there's this quote unquote, this is the value. Turns out you could write hard coded words like quote unquote white, quote unquote black, quote unquote red. There's a few colors that are just so common that every browser knows what they are. But if you want to be a little more sophisticated, you can actually use hexadecimal notation and FF, FF, FF happens to represent. So, white, that's a lot of red, that's a lot of green, that's a lot of blue, which together, like the spectra of light, gives you the white color. And if by contrast you did 0000000, you'd get black. And just like P set 5, if you did FF 0000, you would get a lot of red. So, you can very quickly make some pretty hideous web pages, but you can use these so called hexadecimal codes to be precise as to what they look like. So, I'm not going to focus on too much more of the web hamster because they're actually using a slightly older syntax. We're going to be using in the course, or at least promoting in the course, the latest and greatest version of HTML, which is called HTML5. This is what Steve Jobs and others have been kind of stomping their foot about people using.、Um, the nice thing about HTML5 is that it's a little simpler. Then HTML4, which is sort of last year's version. But I should disclaim that HTML5 as a language isn't quite finalized. The world tends to take like five years before they ever decide on the new version of anything in the computer world. But、um, if you've ever heard that iPhones don't display、um, flash video, but they do display HTML5, what that means is that websites that support like the iPhone and, and these other devices have been designed with a certain version of the language. But the nice thing is, it's by no means Apple specific, this language, HTML5. It just happens to be what Apple decided we're going to support this one. And it is、uh, to be sort of the next iteration. So we will teach you the latest and greatest. And with it, you can actually do some neat things. So even though we're talking for the moment about a web browser, so this here is a little, not to sound like an Apple fanboy here, this is an iPad, but 
using some fairly simple HTML, and as we'll see next week, a language called JavaScript. This is not a native application. This isn't something I downloaded from the、uh, App Store. It's just a website that I'm visiting with Safari. And if my network cooperates and I hit play here, what we did was we went ahead and implemented the same CS50, come on, the same CS50 video interface. Come on, don't embarrass me. Try one more reload. Network's a little spotty. Come on, play. Come on, there we go. Okay, so if you've ever used CS50's videos that have the、uh, slide synchronized transcripts to the side, well, we package this all up using the same language, HTML5, this other language from next week, namely. This is CS50. My name is. So that was some eight weeks ago. So, in short, even though we'll focus conversationally mostly on web browsers, realize that these exact same technologies now are being used to design sites for Android, for、uh, iPhones, for BlackBerry.、Um, this again is very distracting. Sorry about that.、Um, And so realize that what's really cool about the web these days is just how universal it is. You don't have to worry about compiling your code for a Mac or for a PC. We're really now able to develop applications that are pretty much independent of the operating system and the hardware that the user actually has, which is pretty darn exciting. So let's make our simplest of web pages in this language called HTML. So we have set up the cloud in such a way that using your same current cloud accounts, you can start making websites. And You can develop project,、uh, problem set seven and eight here, and also your final projects. And know now, too, if you would like to go out and get for $10 or $20 a sort of a fun domain name, like I saw you harvard.com or harvardfml.com, you can buy these things fairly inexpensively these days on a yearly basis. Realize that for final projects, we'll let you and we'll show you how to map that domain name to your cloud account so that when people visit mywebsite.com, it's actually being hosted on the cloud, even though the world knows your website under whatever favorite name you've chosen. The upside of this is that if you decide to continue your projects after the course or Commercialize them, you can maintain that same branding and just move the website off of the cloud eventually to your own commercial web host. And we'll show you how to do all of that. It's actually relatively easy. So I'm going to go ahead and do this.、Um, it turns out that on typically a Linux system, you can create a special directory, a directory whose name is public underscore HTML. And the server is usually set up in a way that anything inside of that folder is accessible on the World Wide Web. So I'm going to go ahead and do mkdir. Public underscore HTML. And next week's PSET, problem set seven, we'll walk you through these steps. So today we'll go quickly. I'm going to go ahead and hit enter. That will create for me a public HTML directory, which I can then CD into, change directory. And now I'm in my public HTML directory. There might be a few other commands you'll have to write, and we'll walk you through those in the problem set. But now I have some storage space for. My personal web page. So I'm going to go ahead and make my first web page. I'm going to go ahead and open Nano, though you could do this in Text Wrangler, but just so that we're not Mac biased, I'll go ahead and use Nano for today. So I'm going to go ahead and create a file called uh, uh, hello.html. HTML being the world's convention for the、uh, file extension for web pages. And I'm going to start the page as follows open bracket, exclamation point, doc type, HTML. So, this is kind of a stupid habit you should get into, which just tells the browser this is the version of HTML that I'm using. In this case here, the fact that I've not mentioned a version number, it's going to imply to the, server, or to the browser, here comes some HTML5. But now that doesn't mean here comes a web page. It, even though the syntax looks similar, the humans just did not make very good choices here. To tell the, sir, the browser, here comes a web page, I need to actually say open bracket HTML. And then I'm going to get a little ahead of myself and I'm going to preemptively close that tag. So this web page right now, completely uninteresting. But because it's saying, here comes a web page, there goes the web page. There's no content actually there. But it's a good habit to get into, just like you might put a curly brace open and a closed curly brace in your C code, then go back and fill in the blank. Same idea here. So let me go ahead and set up the head of this web page. I'm going to similarly preemptively open the tag and close it. Again, just like in C, it's good habit, but not technologically required to have white space and indentation, but do do it for the sake of style. I'm going to make a web page that says, Hello world. And now I'm done with my title, so I kind of do the opposite open bracket slash. Title with no spaces in there. It's all one big string. All right, that's the head of my web page. Now let me go ahead and make the body. Let me close the body. And now inside of the body, I'm just going to say again, hello world, welcome to my homepage. Just something silly like that. 
And that's it. That is all that's required to make a web page on the World Wide Web. And to be honest, to kind of testify to this, I first learned HTML in like 1995, 96. It was in, I was in Math 20. My math CA,、um, who I got friendly with, we went to the basement of the Science Center one day. He was like, hey, you want to learn HTML? <laughs> <laughs> Can I finish the story?、Uh, can we go to the computer lab in the basement of the Science Center? And he's like, hey, you want to learn HTML? I'm like, sure, I'd love to learn HTML. And so we logged into one of the, <laughs> we logged into one of the, the lab computers. And no joke, like 20 minutes later, I had the most horrific looking website on the internet. But that was testament to just how easy this stuff actually was. So,、um, with that said, let's actually. <laughs> Recreate what my Matt C. A. and I did that day here on stage. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and save this file with Control O, or rather Control X, to get it back to the command line. I've got hello.html. If I do ls, notice that I do have a file, hello.html. I also preemptively put a lectures directory there, but never mind that. So I'm now going to go to my web browser and I'm going to open a new page and I'm going to go to http. Colon slash slash cloud.cs50.net. And this is a slightly stupid convention syntactically, but the world decided that tilde username would represent username's homepage on this particular server. So my username here today is cs50. So I'm going to go to http colon slash slash cloud.cs50.net slash tilde cs50 slash and then hit enter. And unfortunately, I get this weird looking listing. Well, this is just the contents of that directory. Turns out that I made this directory world readable, which probably wasn't smart because now the whole world can see whatever files I happen to have in this directory. Maybe not a big deal because you shouldn't be putting public,、uh, private files in a public directory, but this is not the behavior I want. But wait a minute, I have to remember the file I created was hello.html, so we need to include that in the URL. So I'm going to go to slash hello.html, enter. Damn, problem number two. So you don't have permission to access、uh, hello.html on this server. And notice some other curiosities. I'm being reminded of the name of the server, maybe the statement of the obvious, but port 80. You actually might have seen this number in that little Warriors of the Net video a moment ago. Turns out that there are, of course, all these services on the internet the web, email, instant messaging,、um, VoIP services, all these fun applications that run on top of the internet.、Um, and I'm consciously putting my hand up here to distinguish it from Ethernet. And IP and TCP and all that on top of the internet run all of these services. And the only way a computer knows which service you actually want is that even though we didn't see it yet, anytime a client connects to a server, it doesn't just connect to that IP address, it connects to a specific number, something called a port number. That's just a little hint that says, not only do I want to connect to the cloud.cs50.net or to cnn.com or to the crimson.com, I specifically want the service. That lives at port number 80. And port 80, by convention, is the web. So 80 equals HTTP.、Uh, uh, SSH, you might have noticed, is what port number? 22. So here already we see how a server like the cloud can have a web server on it running on port 80 and an SSH server running on it on port 22 because clients like Putty and Terminal and now the、uh, Firefox and Safari know to send these additional numbers 80 for web, 22 for SSH. Now the server knows when it gets a request, oh, this should be handled by the web server. Oh, this should be handled by the SSH server. It's in this way that servers multiplex among multiple requests that might be coming in on the same. IP address. So that's why we see 80 there. Thankfully, the world decided that in a web browser, if you don't mention port 80, it's just assumed. Otherwise, our URLs would be unnecessarily ugly and a little longer. But I can be pedantic here and I can say after.net colon 80. And then hit enter, and that's actually going to lead to the same place. It quickly disappears because it's in,、uh, inferred, but it is in fact the same. All right, still got a problem. I'm really just stalling because I'm not sure what to do. But wait a minute. I need to go back over to the server and then realize it's not enough to just say this folder is called public HTML. I actually have to make sure that the files within are world readable. By default, as I think we said in、uh, one of the earliest lectures, when you create a file, it's owned by only you. It's readable only by you, and this is a good thing just for privacy's sake. You don't want to create some file and then have anyone on the server be able to access it. So here we see, recall from an earlier p set, is the output of ls l, 
And notice on the left hand side here, RW means read write, but because it's RW all the way on the left, that means only the owner, me, can read and write this file. So I actually need to run a command, and there's few commands I can run,、um, but generally they involve、uh, chmod, C H M O D, for change mode. And then I'm going to go ahead and say A plus R. This means all. The whole world plus R read, let the whole world read the file called hello.html. I hit enter. I then redo ls l. And now notice, sure enough, I get read write access, and then everyone else in the world gets R for read. So now I'm going to go back to the website. I'm going to go ahead and click reload, and voila. My very first web page on the internet. Well, let's see how quickly we can butcher this and make it my first ugliest web page on the internet. Well, that's just some text, but notice at the very top, here's the title. So when I have the title tag、uh, inside my page, that's where it ends up going above the address bar. Let's use BG Color, this thing called an attribute. So I'm going to reopen hello.html. I'm going to add some space there and say BG Color equals quote unquote,、uh, let's say white. Save. Okay, kind of pointless. All right, so let's go back. Let's say black. Save with Control O. OK, pointless for a different reason, right? So I can highlight the text, but now I have a secret web page. All right. <laughs> so now I can do something like this. Even though we saw all capital Fs before, it doesn't matter. Just be consistent, all lowercase or all capitals. This should give me what color? All right, so this is red. So again, even though in the bitmapped world and Microsoft decided that an RGB triple would actually be implemented as BGR for really no good compelling reason, in the real world, when you say RGB, you mean RGB. So FF is R, 0000 is GB. So let's reload. All right, it's getting pretty hideous.、Uh, let's go ahead and try something else. Let's say. Uh, I want to make something bigger. So it turns out I can use special tags called H1. So H1 stands for heading. One means the biggest heading. I have to close it on the other side to be symmetric. I'm going to save this. And so now the text is going to stay the same, but the browsers that support this language called HTML have been designed by their programmers to understand that open bracket H1 means start making the following text big and bold usually. So if I reload the page now, In fact, it is bigger and bolder. If I want to put a second line of text, let me go like this H5. H5, counterintuitively, is smaller. So I'm going to say now, goodbye world, exclamation point, close H5, save that, reload here, and sure enough, it's smaller. So I really haven't done anything terribly sexy, but using now just this idea of a tag, open and close, and an attribute, can we start to now control the construct of a web page? So why don't we go ahead and take Five minute break. So, before we continue our look at web programming, this, this video is actually apropos to the problem set that you just finished or are still finishing up.、Um, this is a video by some researchers who presented novel techniques for resizing images, but resizing images intelligently, whereby you don't just take an image that's too big and then crop it by cutting out uninteresting parts of the photo over here,、um, and you don't just scale it down, thereby shrinking everything. You try to remove some useless information like extra sky or extra. Grass that, in terms of information, doesn't necessarily convey more meaning. But doing this with a computer and doing this dynamically with an arbitrary photograph is non trivial. You can certainly do it with Photoshop、um, and you can do it by hand, touching things up, airbrushing things. But their algorithms that they presented in a、uh, very well known、uh, research conference is about doing this dynamically and actually、uh, reducing images by throwing away content that, again, does not contribute much. So it's just about four minutes and it gets increasingly neat, I think, some of the demonstrations that they. Show. So, one of your classmates passed this along to us. Scene carving for content aware image resizing. Digital media today has the ability to support dynamic page layouts. By changing the window or display size, we can change the layout of a document. However, images embedded in a document typically remain rigid in size and shape. Resizing is also important to fit images into different displays. Current techniques, including cropping or scaling, are limited in their abilities to capture the image content. We present a method for content aware resizing of images. Our technique enables resizing while adapting the image content and layout. This is sometimes called retargeting. We also define a flexible multi size representation for images that supports continuous resizing. An image can be shrunk in a non uniform manner while preserving its features, but it can also be extended beyond its original size. 
Instead of scrolling through images that do not fit in a given display, we gracefully resize them to fit inside the window. For example, assume that we need to change the width of an image. The simplest way to do this is to remove columns of pixels from the image. The best column to remove would be the least noticeable or least important column. We can search for this column by defining an importance or energy function on the image. In this example, we use the gradient magnitude of the image. Next, we look for the column which contains the least energy and remove it. However, using such an approach quickly leads to serious artifacts. Therefore, instead of using rigid columns, we search for connected paths of pixels, or seams, from one side of the image to the other that contain the least energy. This can be done using a simple dynamic programming algorithm as described in the paper in both vertical and horizontal directions. Here's another example of an image, its energy function, and the least noticeable horizontal and vertical seams. By successively removing horizontal and vertical seams, the image can be resized in a non-uniform manner. The order of seam removal in an image defines an order on the pixels of the image. By storing the simple indexing information, we create content-aware multi-size images. In this image, we color all pixels according to the order of their seam removal from blue to red. To enlarge an image, we first calculate seams as if we were to shrink the image. Instead of removing these seams, we insert new seams in these locations. The pixels of the new seams are the average of the pixels alongside the new seam positions. This enables a smooth transition between reducing and enlarging the image size in multi-size images. We have tested different possible energy functions for retargeting such as entropy, saliency, histogram of gradient direction, and eye movement measurements. The results depend on the given image, but simple gradient magnitude often gives satisfactory results. For certain content, such as faces, where the relations between features are important, we define a simple user interface enabling the designer to protect these image areas. The application is also used as an authoring tool for creating multi-sized images. Note that in this specific example, automatic face detection can be used to identify the areas that need protection. To illustrate another application for this tool, we show a simple object removal procedure. By adding negative weights to the energy of an image, the user can attract the seams to pass through specific areas first. By reducing the size of the image, these areas are removed first, in effect erasing them. To retain its original size, the image is enlarged by using seam insertion. Note that this technique changes the whole image and does not simply erase the objects marked. More examples can be found in the paper and the supplemental materials. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your attention. So it really is cool what's on the horizon. A friend of mine is um, a photography expert, and he's, he was recently called in by some lawyers to testify in a case which involved answering the question, was this videotape doctored or not? Um, I'd argue that it's probably going to become increasingly difficult over the years to actually distinguish photographs and videos that were actually taken of reality and ones that were, in fact, um, airbrushed or something much more sophisticated. So some neat technologies are on the horizon. So with that said, we're going to deal with images more akin to um, uh, this thing today, um, perhaps a little, whoops, a little simpler. Web hamster. So these are <laughs> those are images called GIFs. Um, GIFs you might recall from Problem Set Five or one of the things we asked you about. And these are, if you're wondering what it means to be animated animated GIFs. And essentially an animated GIF is kind of like a mini movie where it's just multiple images all tacked inside of the same file and they just play according to some schedule in looping fashion. And here too there's a audio file called a WAV file, W-A-V, that is simply a song that's played on loop on this particular website. So um, how do you actually include these kinds of images though? Well it's just HTML. Again just spoil what's underneath the hood here. If I do look at the raw source, turns out that in addition to the body tag, the head tag 
tag, the title tag, there's also an image tag, IMG. Now, what you'll see is though, even though people would say image or longer words,、um, generally a lot of these tags are abbreviated just for efficiency's sake. But let's go ahead and、um, use such an image. Let's not choose necessarily a hamster, but let's go ahead to, let's say, google.com. Let's go to Google Images and let's choose, well, let's do hamster, bigger hamster. Let's use this guy. It's pretty cute. Let's go ahead and right click or control click. There's different ways to do this. Using SFTP, of course, you could download images that, for which you have the appropriate copyright and such to download.、Um, we're just going to borrow the hamster for just a moment here.、Um, if I go into my web page now, recall that I have hello world and goodbye world. Let me go ahead down below this and really, for no compelling reason, add a hamster image. <laughs> Source, so SRC is the special attribute that I know just from having read the documentation that it commodifies the behavior of the image tag, specifically telling it what image to display. All attributes, values have to be quoted either with double quotes or with single quotes. Just be consistent throughout your files. I'm going to go ahead now and paste that URL. It kind of wraps around, but it in fact is. <laughs> That's one hell of a URL. How to take care of a hamster.com. Guess it was available. So let's go ahead and save this. Hello.html. Let's reload this. And there he is. So now inside of our web page. Now, I'd argue this page is pretty ugly, and it's be ugly because it's not centered, right? So I want to go ahead and center all of the text here. <laughs> So, how do you go about centering? Well, one of the things you should be mindful of when teaching yourself more about HTML, we'll really just scratch the surface in lectures and even in sections. It gets very boring quickly to enumerate the dozens of tags and attributes that exist. Stuff is much easier picked up just from a little reference that's online. We've linked to several on cs50.net slash resources.、Um, it turns out there's a number of ways to accomplish different tasks. We're going to try to promote, at least in sections and lectures, some of the simplest approaches, some of the most common approaches, but realize because Because HTML has been around now for years in version 1, version 2, version 5,、um, you'll see people taking different approaches. Don't get confused by it.、Um, thankfully, there's a tool that I'll show you in a moment with which you can validate your HTML that will tell you does your code as written adhere to current standards. And it will point out syntax errors similar in spirit to what GCC or even Valgrind might do for you. So it's a nice debugging tool of sorts.、Um, I'm going to go ahead now and specify this. Centering these days, back in the day on Web Hamster, you would just say this. So, this for various reasons has kind of fallen out of favor in the web community. And so, you have to be a little more、um, verbose. And what you can do now is center, a, center this content by putting it in a div tag. So, two of the most common tags in web development today are something called a div tag and something called a span tag. These are just structural tags. Whereas h1 and h5 say, make this big and bold, div and span just say, Here comes some content, content that I want to style in some way. So it allows you to group together、um, related material, not unlike in C, the idea of a struct. It's not quite the same, but just as a struct allows you to encapsulate some similar information, the idea of a div at least is to encapsulate some similar information. So here, the information I want is the following lines of text and image. So I can actually do something like this div, and now I'm going to just indent this just to be proper. And then down here, I'm going to go and close the div tag. Now, this is useless. Notice that if I save the file, reload, nothing has actually changed, but div stands for division. So I'm going to temporarily do this. It turns out that most tags support an attribute called style that, as the name implies, allows you to style them aesthetically. There's all sorts of stylization that you can add to a tag, including color and font size and margins and, and、um, background colors and borders, a lot of as purely aesthetic details. One of them, though, is called background color. So, even though a moment ago I used BG color, this is kind of the old school way of using this attribute called BG color. Most people these days style almost all of their content using this style attribute. So, that's a habit I'll now get into. Background hyphen color allows me to change just the color of this division of the page. So, let's just go for hideous and say yellow. So, this div. Which think of as literally a division of the page. They're always rectangles. So the following rectangle that's fitting all of the following content, the h1, the h5, and the image, should have a background color of yellow. Let's save that, reload, and sure enough, there it is.、Right? So、this is not too far off from what I made in 1995, frankly. So notice there's some curiosities here. In the top, there's some, there's some margins. And these are, frankly, some stupid headaches when it comes to browser development. If we open this web page, not only in Firefox, but Safari and Internet Explorer and Chrome, odds are you would see stupid, minute little differences that might, nonetheless might tug at the.、Um, 
the nitpicky side of you, whereby on Firefox, feels like we have like a centimeter or so of red pixels, a margin around this. Well, Internet Explorer, Microsoft might have decided not going to be a centimeter, it's going to be half a centimeter. So, one of the headaches, frankly, early on in web development is just understanding some of the stupid differences, frankly, in that the various browser manufacturers have made when it comes to implementing these tags. But for the most part, it's minor details.、Um, though we'll see in JavaScript that sometimes it matters a bit more. Thankfully, there exist libraries that we've discussed in the context of C that get rid of almost all of these cross platform、uh, headaches. So, for now, the point is just that I've made a division of the page, but I haven't aligned it. It turns out I want to say text align. So, if you want to have multiple properties, what I've just done here with background color. Colon yellow. This is a CSS, cascading style sheet property. And that simply says, make the div background color yellow. If I want another such property, I can simply say semicolon. And then I can say something like text hyphen align center. And this will align now all of the text inside of that div as centered. So let's save this, reload. And sure enough, now things are centered. And again, there's different ways to do this, but the point for today is really to take away these ideas of tags, and we've been looking at some tags already, attributes, even though some of them have started to fall out of favor, in favor of the style tag. And then as for these properties, well, there's so many different properties out there. And it's actually nice because almost always you can accomplish some goal with a property whose name kind of says what it does. But to pick up with these kinds of things, again, be mindful of resources like this. If I go to the courses homepage, Slash resources, and notice that we have under here like a tutorial on CSS. Again, CSS only refers to at the moment these things inside of quotes, inside of the style tags value.、Um, and then we can go down here to HTML, where we have a bunch of tutorials on HTML and tags thereof. Just to give you a sense of this, let me go to HTML and let me pull up,、uh, let's see, let's just give you a whirlwind tour. So, it turns out you can make tables. Here is a silly little table for apples, bananas, oranges, and other, but you can have some tabular structures in HTML with the right tags. You can have these familiar lists. You can have an automatically numbered list. You can have a bulleted list here on the right hand side. And all of these are fairly easy. So, just for the sake of some arbitrary examples, let's do a couple of more of these tags.、Uh, my page, again, I'm not shooting for pretty today, but let's suppose that I actually want Goodbye World to take me away from this web page. I want it to be a so called hyperlink. Well, it turns out making a hyperlink is actually Pretty easy. So I can simply do something like this. I'm going to get rid of the H5, though I could leave it, but I just want to keep this simple. I'm going to get rid of H5, and instead I'm going to say, you know what? The following should be an anchor. A for anchor, hyper reference. Where do I want to go? Well, anytime you leave a site, it seems to go to like, let's go to Disney.com. All right, so now let's scroll over here, close bracket. That's not actually true. So when now, when I click this text, goodbye world, this should take me to the value of the href attribute, which is this thing here. So I seem to have implemented the very familiar idea of a hyperlink. So let me go back to my web page, reload, and hmm, that was not what's intended. So notice、uh, the goodbye world moved, but it seems to now be over here. So, why is this? It looks like structurally I haven't changed the web page, but a web browser is kind of stupid. It only does what you tell it to do with these things called tags. And so, in fact, even though it's implied by the H1 tag, which is a heading tag, this is a heading. So, therefore, give it its own row, give it its own line. With most tags, they don't get their own line. And this is good because otherwise, anytime you try to commingle tags in a web page, everything would be on its own line. So, that's not good behavior. So, if you really want There to be a line break in between that tag and that image, I have to tell the browser, put line break here. Open bracket, br for break, close bracket, says put a line break here. And now the browser will interpret this code literally. If I reload, now sure enough, I have the link that's just above the hamster. And if I click this, I'll be whisked away to Disney.com, which currently looks like this apparently. Anything interesting? Okay, no. All right, so,、um, so what are the takeaways here? So now we have another tag, this idea of an anchor, which gives you the familiar hyperlink. Well, what are some of the other familiar tags? Any little feature of HTML you'd like to see? Those are kind of the biggies, right? It's kind of amazing, frankly, what the world has constructed with some fairly simple ones. What was that? 
fonts. OK, that's a good one, actually. Right now, I seem to be preferring、uh, Times New Roman everywhere. But surely, we have the ability to express other fonts. And actually, that reduces to CSS. And let me just pull up the reference for CSS that we recommend on the site, though there are plenty and plenty of resources online. Let me go ahead to CSS, CSS tutorial, and let me choose styling fonts. What you'll see is that、um, you have the ability, per this tutorial, which I'll actually、um, do rather than just talk about, you have the ability to specify the font、uh, face, the font family that you want to display text in, the font size, the font color, and a bunch of other details as well. But there is a gotcha. Just because you might have a font called Myriad Pro on your computer, that doesn't mean that your millions of users are similarly going to have that font. So you're actually somewhat limited these days to choosing, frankly, ugly fonts like Times New Roman. Or you know, old common fonts like Times New Roman, but you at least have precision over,、um, you can specify a list of fonts that the browser should try to use in order and use the first one that it actually finds. In fact, if we look at, let's say, Facebook.com, you'll see that this site actually looks a little different on Macs and PCs, also depending on what fonts you have installed. Because if I can find this,、uh, let me see if I can. Make web development all the more real here by reloading this page, clicking CSS. Let me try this. I'm going to try a little trick that we'll spend more time on to come, but it looks like Facebook uses, hopefully, I can prove my point. Yes, thankfully, Mark has chosen to the default font to be Lucida Grande,、uh, followed by Tahoma, if you don't have that, followed by Verdana, followed by Arial, followed by the very generic sans serif. And sans serif just means without serifs, which means the little cute little curves that a font might have. So, this is Facebook's comma separated list of all of the fonts the browser should try to use in order to render their website. And of course, if you don't have some of those fonts, you might see a slightly different variant of this web page than someone else. But actually, the fact that I pulled up Facebook here is actually a good teaser for one of the most useful features of websites. You don't just have hyperlinks, you don't just have.、Um, You don't just have images and other markup. You actually have the ability to take input from the user. For instance, here we have what appear to be text boxes. Up here we have what we call a checkbox. Down here we have a select menu. Uh, or a drop down menu. And so these are very familiar concepts. We use them every day of the,、uh, the week, most likely, interacting with websites. But with these very basic building blocks, has the world built up some really neat capabilities. So, first the font, then the capabilities. Suppose I really want to make,、uh, let's say, goodbye bigger. So it turns out I can go into this anchor tag. And I can add another attribute. If you want to have multiple attributes, you just separate them by spaces. So, attribute equals quote unquote value, space. Attribute equals quote unquote value, space. So, if I want to style this tag, I say style equals quote unquote. And then in the quotes, I need to say something like font family. And let's do、uh, Tahoma, whatever that looks like. And then semicolon font hyphen size, colon, let's say 96 points. All right, save. And again, it's just wrapping with nano here, but that is, in fact, all one line. All right, because my font's a little big. Let me go back to this hideous website, click reload, and it's gotten even bigger. So, again, you can do some real damage quickly with this, but it also suggests that you have really precise control over. <laughs> this is actually not a bad web page now.、Um, so, now, <laughs> now you have.、Um, and we'll save this one. All right, so now you have.、Um, Really precise control over the rendition of the page. And so, even though it feels a little messy, frankly, it is a little messy what we're building up here because we have HTML, we also have CSS, and the CSS is just inside of the quote marks. These are two separate languages, HTML and CSS, that are getting commingled. But、um, realize that we can now actually get some input from the user. So, literally, let me go to,、uh, let's see, lectures,、uh, it's source. So, literally, the first thing、um, that you might want to do is get input from the user. So, here's how we might want to re implement Google ourselves.、Right? This is pretty much what Google looked like back in 1999 or so. Let's go ahead and take a look at this web page's source code. And let's see how this site was implemented. As an aside, before I forget, I see that I accidentally capitalized doc type on all of these、uh, printouts. I will go back and make them consistent because I'm using lowercase for those doc types up top. So, FYI, I will fix in the printouts. But for now, notice how simple it is to implement Google, right? So, we have the head at the top of the web page. We then have a title called Fake Google, just so I don't.、Um, 
uh, upset them. Now I have body. And so in the body, what did I do? Div style equals text align center. So this just means here comes a band of content, a division of content. Make it all centered. And here's where there's this annoying semantic、um, inconsistency. I'm saying text align, but even things like the button you just saw will also be centered as a result. So there's some, you know, there's some quirks in the languages here. But text align center means make everything centered. I have an H1 tag, which just means give me some big bold text to say fake Google. And then this new tag. So here's yet another tag for us today. There's a form tag, open bracket form. The action attribute, according to the manual, says give me the URL of a program, a web based program, to which I should submit this user's form. So apparently, I want, I kind of cut a corner here. I didn't actually implement all of Google. I'm actually going to submit this form to the real Google and leverage their back end. So here I have form action equals quote unquote this. All right, so now close bracket. Notice that the close form is down here. So notice inside of this form is a bunch of input elements. And this is where we have these basic user interface mechanisms. We have an input tag, a name I'm going to give Q, Q just meaning query,、uh, type equals text. This means it's going to be a text box and not a button or checkbox or something like that. Then I have a line break, which just says put the next thing on the next line. And what's the next thing? There's another input type that I found in the manual called type equals submit. And it turns out you can label this submit input, which happens to be rendered as a button,、uh, with a value, namely fake Google search. So at the end result is that I have a form not unlike Google version 1.0. I can type in something like hamster here, click fake Google search, and let's actually see what happens. Well, let me pull up Firebug just so I can sniff my own network traffic and see what's going on. I'm going to go ahead and click on fake Google search. And notice what happens at top to the URL because of that action attribute fake Google search. Voila, I have implemented Google, right? I have my own front end now to Google. But notice how this worked. What's interesting is that I indeed ended up at Google.com. No surprise there. But notice what the URL looks like http colon slash slash www.google.com slash search. That was in my action attribute. Question mark. Q equals hamster. So it turns out when we've been using this special keyword get, Get slash, well, you don't have to just get slash. You can get slash search. And in fact, if you add a question mark to almost any URL, you can then pass in a ampersand separated list of what are called parameters. So this is, again, just another word for the notion of、uh, an argument or a parameter, or it is a parameter, another word for an argument. But in the context of the web, question mark means to the browser or to the server, here come some parameters, here come some arguments. What's the first argument? Q. What's its value? Well, it equals hamster. And so, this is the way that a web browser, which is just a fairly dumb program sitting somewhere on the internet on my little old computer, passes input into a web server. Because web servers, meanwhile, are designed to look at the incoming requests and it sees, oh, get slash search question mark q equals hamster. So, the program that Google wrote, which is probably written here in Python or a similar language, they see, oh, here's a parameter called q, its value is hamster. Let me search my data. Database for this keyword hamster, find a big list, a linked list or an array of all of the web pages that match, and then you know what I want to do? I want to actually return to the user a web page, a little white lie I'm about to tell, a web page that contains a whole bunch of HTML with which to render. That their web page. Now, it's a little white lie because Google, as you might have noticed, now has instant search and all these fancy features where you actually don't download the HTML all at once when you first visit the page. Rather, they get it using a technology called AJAX, whereby it gets the data behind the scenes and then immediately integrates it into the website. But if I do this old school and turn off instant search and actually now research for hamster and reload my、uh, page's source code, you'll notice that. That's kind of a long thing. Let's go and put this into here. This is the code, which is a mingling of HTML and JavaScript that I got back from Google's website when I asked for all web pages related to hamsters. It's cryptic.、Um, in fact, for someone like Google, when you get a billion hits per day, if every hit, this is actually a neat curiosity. With Google, someone like Google, if a programmer accidentally or just to be nice and pretty hits the space bar just to indent something, that's one additional character, one additional byte magnified by a billion visits per day. That's one gigabyte worth of downloads that Google now has to incur and then spend for. And so these These days, super fancy websites like Google and Facebook, which have a ridiculous amount of traffic for which every little penny and every little bit counts, they do what's called minify their source code. So it's a little harder to learn from these websites sometimes, unless 
you use this tool like Firebug. If I go to Firebug and view this same web page down here, Notice one of the powers of Firebug. No matter what, how big a mess someone's web page is, notice what Firebug does is it cleans it all up for you. So, this is in fact how Google is implemented. And as promised, notice that they make ample use of these things called div tags. It looks like they have a few other attributes like ID and class, but we really just scratched the surface. What we'll tease you with today is this last thing here. The, literally, the very first thing I learned how to do on, with regard to web programming. Was something that looked like this.、Um, back in the day, you would walk across the yard to Wigglesworth, hand in a piece of paper into a Proctor's Dropbox if you wanted to register for a freshman intramural sport. In 1996, We put the freshman intramural sports program onto the internet. And it looked a little something like this, literally, although I think I had like、um, big pictures of soccer balls and volleyballs and images in the background just to make it cool.、Um, wasn't so cool, but I'll find that image for Wednesday. But using these same building blocks, input type equals text, input type equals submit, you can actually then take input from the user, let them hit submit, get an email to yourself, get their name added to the database, all the sorts of things you might want to do for final projects. So, more on that on Wednesday.